good evening all and uh, thank you very much for tuning into all india runners motivation a channel where we bring in stories from uh, india and also from abroad uh, today's guest is someone who's like i would say like an energizer battery uh, never stops running and uh, you know in honor of uh, his presence i did not uh, you know trim my beard for the past one week because he has got a long beard maybe slightly longer than me uh he is a champion a ultra marathon legend someone who has been running ultra marathons uh 50 kilometers and above for the past 20 plus years and he is uh, also won more than 25 plus uh, ultra marathons most of them are his favorite distance is 100 miles you know something which many of us can't think of and he just keeps on going and the thing is that right now he has also taken into something new he has also started coaching a lot of athletes it gives me great pride and pleasure Uh, to invite uh, my guest today my guest for today is addressing india uh, for the first time it gives me great pride and pleasure to welcome in our channel mr jeff hey Hi, jeff. thank How you are? i'm glad to be on thank you so much and uh, uh, namaste from india so <laughs> yes <laughs> so uh, how has it been in arizona i heard the summer is there uh, when uh, how, how is the weather the summers here we have we it's gotten hot uh we've had some wildfires so we got a little smoke um which is kind of typical for this time of year in the southwest united states uh it's kind of our fire season june may and june and early july is usually our fire season before we kind of have a um a monsoon season that starts in july august and september so we get afternoon rainstorms uh that develop and we're right on the edge of that so we had some rain yesterday afternoon but uh it's still pretty pretty dry and it's gotten really hot so the last week or so has been uh you know fahrenheit that's been triple digits in the desert around us i live at a higher altitude so it doesn't get quite that hot but it will be in the 90s it was 95 yesterday so uh you know that that's pretty hot um what is that 30 probably 38 celsius okay uh 38 celsius is kind of uh, normal in many places in india uh, you know i come from the south of india uh, and the southernmost part of india we got only three three different climates hot hotter and hottest uh, <laughs> so we don't have anything in between there is no winter maybe rain comes in between but we never have any uh, any winter so so it's nice that you know you got you get you got to enjoy different types of uh, climates uh, i heard that you know from you that you have just shifted i hope um uh, how has been the unpacking of the of the things you know because that takes the longest time how has been the shift and how was the unpacking of uh, luggage yeah it's been good i mean we moved here in march so and and it, you know that's enough time to before i start racing this summer to get used to the altitude the altitude's higher here so we live at about 7000 feet um you know so about two little over 2000 meters um and um i w- i was at about maybe 1500 meters before so uh that's been a good little bump up in training to be at a higher altitude and drier climate so we have a longer running season where i moved because i lived in the northern united states up in montana so uh we had a lot longer winter and a lot more snow and it was okay. colder for longer so um it's been good it's been good for training to move down here okay fantastic and a higher altitude will also help you with your endurance then Yeah, it definitely helps with mountain training and mountain racing. You know, everything I do is mainly mountain racing, so um especially in the western United States, everything's mountainous and, or or desert. It's either mountain or desert, but uh it definitely is beneficial for training. Okay. Uh when you're talking about climate, one of the audience members out here uh said he stays in the western part of India. He says average temperature is 45 degrees plus uh in that uh in that place where he's staying. So When he heard 38 degrees, that sounds like winter for him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it sounds really good. Now we do have we have like 40s, 40s in the in just south of of Flagstaff. So we're up on kind of a plateau and um, at higher altitude. But once you drop off the plateau to the south towards Phoenix, Arizona, uh, and Sedona, Arizona, it gets really hot. So I've been training for Western states, and it's going to be hot at Western states. It can be in the 40s. So I I've been down where it's been in the 40s doing some training runs just about it's about a 40 40 minute drive south of me. So I have been able to experience uh your listeners 
uh, that heat, it's hot for sure. Okay. So okay. I do not envy him. <laughs> now you are like the ninja of Western states and hard rock put together. So we'll talk about that later in the uh, later during the interview. So I mean, yes. I, I had I listened to a lot of your podcasts and interviews, uh, but uh, you know, very less uh, less been sp spoken about your childhood. Uh, I know everything you know starts from uh, age uh, twenty one onwards or twenty eight onwards. Uh, before that, uh, you know, I know I mean I do understand that you lived in a very huge farm, which is seven hundred acres. Uh, just tell us about your life at the farm, and you know, uh, how was it? Uh, how much time would it take to cover seven hundred acres? <laughs> it was a, it, there was a lot of it, it. Yeah, you didn't cover it on foot. Um, you, you most of the time. I mean, we we used. Uh, you know, I grew up on a seven hundred acre farm, so and it was it was kind of a broken up farm. So we had like some land that was all kind of right where around our house, and then we had like other pieces of land and other sections around in the countryside. So you'd have to drive, you know, gravel dirt roads to get to the other pieces of farm that we farmed. And we farmed like crops. So uh, wheat and uh, soybeans and, and corn. And um, so it's kind of a typical, uh, mid, it was in the mid Midwestern United States, Missouri. And it's very hot and humid uh, in the summers. Um, and we also had uh, livestock. We had we had hogs and or pigs and cattle um, as well. So it was a <laughs> we worked hard. Uh, a lot of working in the heat uh, and a lot of hard labor um, growing up and learning to work hard. My grandfather and my my father uh, farmed together. Um, so I was always around one side of my family. My grandfather and my grandmother always lived um, really close. You know, four hundred meters away we their house was really close um to our house so i i spent a lot of time with my grandparents growing up um and i had a i had a i had a lot of uh uh i had a lot of freedom to just run kind of free and run all over the farm and go to you know um, down to rivers and play in the water and go to the forest and uh um when i wasn't working um, we, we ended up working a lot though. We, I mean, it was a busy farm and, uh, uh, was, you know, learned to, to work hard at a, at a young age. Uh, but it was fun, you know, it had a lot of freedom. So, you know, it, 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 it was, uh, um, it was a good upbringing, you know, and I played sports and a lot of, you know, traditional American sports in the 1980s, uh, football, baseball, basketball, uh, track and field, uh, kind of the main, main old school sports in the United States. So, uh, my dad was always a coach, you know, for my, a lot of my teams when I was a kid. Okay. So I, I spent a lot of time, you know, playing sports in between having to work on the farm. Okay, fine. Uh, how did that help in your running then? Well, I, I think the biggest thing was, uh, from a running perspective, like, we, you know, our close, our neighbors, you know, our, our, uh, other farmers that had kids, if I wanted to play with kids, um, we, you know, they lived at, you know, at least a mile away, sometimes two miles away. So we would like, and it was, it wasn't a direct route. So like there was all these windy gravel roads and dirt roads. And so if they lived over here and I lived over here, we would meet in the middle on the farmland and like say at a Creek or a river and in the woods to play for the day. And so you, I'd have to run, you know, half a mile or a mile um, cross country to, to meet up with the kids. So we'd call on the phone and we'd say, okay, I'm leaving my house right now. Are you leaving your house? And then okay. we'd, you know, and then we'd all meet it and play like tag or, or capture the flag or something like that at the Creek and in the woods um, come home all dirty and muddy and then, uh, um, so a lot of running, I mean, a lot of jogging, you know, to like, or I, you know, for example, my, my grandparents lived about 400 meters away up a dirt road. And I would, I would just, you know, it, my grandmother kept ice cream in, in her freezer in, in a big box freezer in the basement down in the, in the, in the, in the Midwest, everybody has basements, you know, like yeah, underground yeah. below the house. And, uh, um, so that's like storage and like food storage sometimes. And, um, so they had this big box freezer that they kept ice. She kept ice cream in 
And so if I wanted ice cream during a hot summer, I'd have to run to her house. So I'd run 400 meters to her house, go in the house, get ice cream. Hi, grandma. Bye, grandma. With ice cream in my hand and run back home eating okay. ice cream. So okay. um, there's a lot of running and a lot of movement. So um, I didn't sit still. I played outside all the time. You know, I, I was always outside. Um, I, I, I was not a in, in the house um, kid. So okay. it was fun. It's nice. I mean, it's, uh, you know, when you talk about your grandparents, it's like all grandparents have got one special storage space for their grandchildren, which only, you know, the grandchildren would, would know. And they would on, on and often raid that storage space. It can be <laughs> like chocolates. For you, it is ice cream, but for many other people, it might be chocolates or any other treats. So, yeah, right. so that, that is really nice to hear about uh, that. And I'm sure that, uh, you know, really helped you. Uh, you know, you said your father was a coach uh, for you in your track and field because you start in, in high school, you did a lot of track and field. Uh, what are the things actually you learned from him from a sports perspective, uh, you know, which actually helped you in the future also? Well, I think, he, um, you know, he was always, um, I was really in my younger days, I was a very shy kid, very like um, timid a little bit. So my dad was a big sports person like he loved all sports he watched sports on tv um he was very involved in like all the sports and helping as i came up until i got to be you know 14 15 years old and then then like our our, our school public school systems had sports programs and i had other coaches but it, up until i was about 13 or 14 he was kind of a primary coach in a lot of sports like baseball flag football because we did flag football before you did like you know traditional football, you know, so pads and helmets. And um, before we got into helmets and, and pads um, and hitting each other hard, we played flag football where you just had a flag, a belt on with a flag hanging off your waist and you had to okay. pull the flag instead of tackle. Um, so we grew up, so not soccer, you know, everybody yeah. calls it football in the United States. Everybody <laughs> outside the United States football is soccer. Um, we know about it now. <laughs> but I love soccer or football. You know, uh, I, so I'm actually helping with my daughter's soccer team right now. Um, okay. I was in a soccer. I'm, I'm the conditioning coach for my daughter's soccer team. So okay. um, they practice on Tuesday nights. And on Thursday nights, we do drills and conditioning. And the, the main coach has a – is, is a very busy job. So he can't come on Thursday nights. And then we play on Saturdays, play games on Saturdays. So I was, I, I do conditioning with the team. Um, she's 15 and um, playing soccer and, uh, or football. Um, okay. And uh, anyway, like, like as far as a coach goes, my dad was just a very good influence as far as like, he made me work hard. He made me practice at home. So I did extra. So I learned early that, if you want to excel in sports, you can't just show up and do what the coach asks you to do. You need to go do a little extra, you know, when you get home. So, he, you know, I was always bothering him to like, you know, hey, can you help me with this? Or will you throw the, you know, pass the football to me? Will you throw pitch and catch with the baseball? You know, um, whatever it was. Or I was setting up my own like obstacle courses or track courses in our in our yard in the grass you know, to run, you know, I was, you know, I had friends that would come over and we'd play sports. I mean, that's what we did on our, in our spare time um, was just play. So, okay. you know, it was a lot of running, you know, and you didn't, I didn't even know it at the time because we were playing team sports, you know, but I was running all the time and it just kind of played into playing sports. I got into track and field when I was about 12 years old okay. um, and first was attracted to running the hurdles um, and then, um, realized that I was pretty good at distance or longer, the longer the race. And back then there wasn't long, long races for younger kids. And, um, at, back in the 1980s. So, you know, I think the longest distance we did was like the half mile. So 800 meters. Um, and so I really kind of got attracted to the 800 meter, um, early and at like, you know, probably 12 or 13 and, um, always did track and field, but I was very focused on, American football, um, okay. because in the 1980s, American football in the Midwestern United States was such a big sport uh, in the fall. And so I just that's my all my other sports that I played basketball, baseball, they all in track and field. They all were to be fit for football. So, OK, 
I really loved football and I was really focused on football, but I was good at track and field and I didn't even know it. I just was doing it because um, our head football coach was the track coach in high school okay. and he made us go out for track if we wanted to play football. So um, I got into, uh, I got into the 800, ran the 800 in high school. So when I was like 14 or 15, 16, 17, 18 was running 800 meters as my main, main event. I mean, I ran the 400 meter, the real and relays, the, the 1600 meter relay, the 3,200 meter relay at the time. Yeah. Um, and, uh, we just ended up, you know, I, I, 800 meter was my focus in high when I was in high school. So when I was 15 to 18, uh, 800 meters. So I ran 202 for the 800 meter, uh, as my best time, uh, when I was 18. Uh, and then I went to college and got into mountain biking. So okay. I did, I just, I, I kept running, but more for like, just, uh, for fun two or three yeah. days a week, I would jog, you know, really easy with headphones on, um, just to keep fit, lifted weights and mountain biked. So that's kind of my progression in sports. And then I didn't find ultra running until my late twenties. So I dabbled a little bit in backpacking and climbing and in my twenties, um, I had moved from after college in the mid in the, in Missouri, I moved to the, you know, one of the things that if you're attracted to, if you ever get introduced to the mountains, there were no mountains in, in the Midwest in the United States. So like the mountains were all West. So I took some trips during high school to the mountains to ski and I really fell in love with the mountains. And so when I got out of college, um, I just had always told my parents and my family, I'm like, I'm moving West. I'm moving West to the mountains. So I moved to Denver, Colorado, um, when I was 25 and, uh, was mainly a mountain biker and snowboarder, started snowboarding and really got into mountain sports and climbing and in my twenties. And then I found, and I started dabbling in trail running and, but it was not really on my radar still. I did, I didn't, I was just a mountain biker and a climber and I was just so focused on mountain biking. And then, uh, um, I had, when I moved to Oregon in 2000, in 2000, so I would have been, uh, 20, 28, 29 years old. Um, one of my best, one of my first friends that I, I met in that town, um, had just started getting in. He had run some marathons and had really got into old to ultra marathons. Um, and I, so I signed up for a marathon and I signed up for a 50 K trail race. Um, and once I did a 50 K trail race, I was hooked. I was like hooked on the sport, the community, uh, you know, all the stuff that goes along with trail running and mountain running. And, and I like the idea of putting all the sports together. So, you know, mountain biking, you can travel a bunch of mile, miles or kilometers in a short amount of time in the woods and in, in wild spaces on trail. And I really like that aspect of, of, of mountain biking. But sometimes you couldn't go up super, super steep stuff. You know, if it got too steep, you can't ride that on a mountain bike. But as a climber, you do a lot of power hiking uphill to find get to the cliff. And then you climb and then you yeah. hike back down with all your gear on your back. Or if yeah. you backpack, you know, you backpack with all your gear on your back, but it's really heavy and it's slow. I like the idea of putting all those disciplines together, you know, traveling really fast and light, being able to go up and summit mountains really fast and light in a day and then come back down. And once you're fit enough and you have the fitness and endurance of like mountain biking and, you know, the same as mountain biking, that you can travel, a, you can travel, you know, 50 K in a day or a hundred K in a day. And all of a sudden it like opens up the adventure and the exploring in the, in the, you know, in wild places like mountains and woods and forests. It's really, really, it was really like attractive to me. And that's what really hooked me on the sport of ultra running. Okay. I mean, I really liked your reference of, uh, you know, mountain biking and also getting into the ultra marathon. Uh, mountain biking would have definitely helped you in, in your, uh, you know, uh, in your quads and calves uh, development. So uh, because you would be on the bike and you'll be cycling a lot. Uh, did that really help you actually? Yeah, it really does. I, I mean, I still I still ride my bike. Uh, you know, I still am into cycling. I don't do it as much now because I train so much for running. But but I use it as a supplement to endurance training. Uh 
and I commute. I have like a bike commuter. So I'll get on my bike and I'll ride, you know, to the store sometimes. I also use it as a commuter to go to trailheads. So from my front door at my house, you know, I'm, I live in a city, so um, I can ride, you know, 20 or 30 minutes and be at a trailhead or in the woods, in the forest, lock my bike up to a tree and, uh, and then go for a run and then jump on my bike and ride home. So I use it as kind of a, a, a for commuting um, back and forth to trails. Um, I use it for running around town to run some errands and, you know, and buy things and go to the store or whatever sometimes, or just getting my kids out too. I go out and ride with my kids uh, okay. and that kind of thing, but it's a great supplement for fitness and you're right. It really helps your leg strength. Um, it really helps calves, quads, all those things. Okay. So, but, um, that's really nice to know. So your first uh, ultra marathon was the, uh, the hag mud 50 K, which uh, I think the timing was around 451, 37. Uh, you know, you, I know that your friend pushed, uh, you know, into, into doing this, uh, but, uh, just tell us about this race because it seems to be one of your favorite races. You've done it multiple times and many times. So tell I've us about this race. It, it was kind of like, um, when I first got into the sport, uh, in the 2000s, 2001, um, in those first, you know, 10 years in the sport, there weren't as many races in the United States as there are now. So, uh, and I was younger and I, and I, I was, uh, I had a lot less money. Um, so <laughs> I did, <laughs> I raced local races in Oregon because we had an Oregon ultra marathon series it was like eight races that you could run in the state. So it was, a, it was, it was a short drive, you know, to a lot of the places to go race. So, um, Hag Lake, um, was a, a early season spring race. And, and in, in Oregon, there's a mountain range that runs through the middle of the state. And on the Western half, it's rainy and very, very green and muddy and doesn't get much snow. And on the Eastern slope, um, I lived in the, on the Eastern desert side where we get snow in the winter and it's colder, but we get a drier, uh, climate. So I would always come over the mountains in the early spring to run the muddy races because it was really muddy. Um, the trail races were super muddy. It rains a lot. And um, so we ended up, you know, all the ultra runners from Bend, Oregon, when I lived in Bend, uh, would drive from the desert up and over in the spring because we had snow on the ground in February. And so we were like looking for places to race and train. So we'd use these this race as kind of our first, 50 K of every season just to okay. see how to see, see how you're doing and go run in the mud, um, 50 K in the mud. And it was super muddy. Uh, sometimes the mud would be, you know, this deep. Um, wow. and yeah, you couldn't even see your feet. Sometimes you lose a shoe. Um, <laughs> and you'd have to like stick your hand in the mud and grab your shoe out and put it back on. <laughs> um, and so it was really muddy. It was fun. And it all, and, and back then the, the sport was so small still, especially in the United States, that, you know, it was almost like a, a little uh, community homecoming of everyone showing up for that first race of the year. And we, you know, pe you'd see people from, you know, Seattle and Portland and like Northern California would come up for the race and, and people, and you just started seeing the same. That's one of the things that attracted me to ultra running in the United States originally was that sense of like community and like, you know, getting to know all these people that had like interests of like running on trails uh, and we just hang out for the weekend and run in the mud and, um, and then tell the stories afterwards of like, Oh my gosh, did you lose your shoe? Oh yeah. I lost my shoe. Um, okay. you know, so that, it was really fun. Uh, it was a fun race. And, um, like I said, I just kept coming back and used it as a trainer every year as my first 50 K to run. Okay. So how many times have you run it till now? I, I can't even remember, uh, <laughs> at least five or six, seven times. I don't know. I've run it a ton of times. Um, okay. and I don't live there anymore. So, you know, I moved away there. I moved out of Oregon in 2017, um, lived in Utah for two years, Montana for two years. And now I live in Arizona. So it's a long, long drive. So okay. I don't do it anymore, but, uh, but I race, you know, I'll, I'd race local stuff here, but you know, the last few years I've been concentrating on hundred milers. So, yeah. uh, that I kind of concentrate on more longer races now. So did you train for this race or was it like, like off the cuff, you know, just 
Let me try it out. Oh, say that again. Sorry, you cut out. I said, did you, I said, did you train for this race, the first 50K? Or was it like, you know, okay, fine, I'm, uh, I'm uh, you know, strong enough to run this race? Oh, yeah. So that first time, I, I really didn't know what I was doing. Um, okay. training wise. I, I, I mean, I, I rode back then I ran, you know, I run six, seven days a week now, but, um, but I've been doing it 21 years. So, um, I can handle the volume now, but back then I couldn't, I came from mountain biking and backpacking and hiking. So I didn't, I didn't really, I, I ran four days a week. I biked on my mountain bike two days a week. Uh, and then, uh, I ran, I don't know, maybe 60, 70 K a week, um, at the most one long run. And then a bunch of like shorter, you know, three other shorter runs and then spent some time on my mountain bike. Um, so I, I definitely was hurting the first time I did it. I, I ran, you know, the first half went okay. And then the second half was kind of slow and it, my legs hurt really bad. Uh, okay. so it was really hard, you know, and I did, I didn't start racing, ultra marathons until about 2004. Uh, so about three years after I got into the sport, I, the first three years, I just was trying to finish them and figure them out. And, and as you know, like you have to figure out nutrition and hydration and electrolyte balance and all the other things that go along with running long and really long. And, and, and so that becomes an important piece, not just running. So there's a lot of other disciplines that you have to figure out to be a good ultra marathon runner. So uh, I, I, I took me years to figure that stuff out of, you know, trial and error and trying to figure out what I was, should do and what works and what doesn't work. Okay. Uh, you said that it took, you know, a couple of years for you to run, uh, ultra marathons, but actually within one year, you actually ran a hundred K also, you know, uh, in 2002, right? So how did you manage yeah. this progression from 50 K to hundred K 50 K was really difficult, but after well, that, you I did hundred K. Yeah, I did a progression, you know, I did a traditional progression of like ran a marathon, then ran a 50 K, couple of 50 Ks. And then I ran uh, a 50. I, I trained, I didn't race one, but I, I ran a 50 miler by myself um, for training. Um, uh, and then um, in training for the 100 K and ran 100 K. So, you know, I kind of progressed 50 K, 80 K, 100 K. Um, and, and all of that was to train for Western States 100 as my first 100 miler in 2002. So it's a lottery. And I got into the lottery in uh, 2001. In, the, in November of 2001, I found out I got in for June of 2002. So in that time, I was like, I was training with a, that, that friend I was telling you about that got me into it. And my re really good friend, Rod Bean, um, who lives, still lives in Bend, Oregon. And he... Uh, you know, uh, we, we trained together a ton. We, it was before we had kids. Um, we both have three kids now and both our boys are the, are almost 19 years old. Um, so our oldest boys. And so like we, we had kids started having kids around the same time, but we were talking about having kids, but we like decided, okay, we're going to run a hundred miler. And okay. so to run a hundred miler, you had to, you had to train, uh, uh, you had to, qualify back then with a 50 miler and so in the summer of or in the season of 2001 we ran two 50 k's and a 50 miler to qualify get in the lottery in november we got into the race and then we we ran 50k 100k to get ready for the 100 miler in june of 2002 so we just did this progression of like learning to do it and we did have we luckily had some older ultra runners in our town that were into the sport like three guys that kind of mentored us, you know, they took us under their wing and just like told us like how to eat, how to, you know, do electrolytes, how, how to carry water. Um, you know, all the things that go along with like ultra running and learning, they kind of took us out and showed us where to run and like where some of the cool routes to train on um, and where we lived. So they really kind of showed us, uh, kind of, there was a really, a really cool way to learn the sport. It's kind of like climbing or sports like that, where you always have, you know, have a partner in climbing, you need a partner. And, um, and someone is always like, there's always someone who has more experience than you and gives you, you know, tips and, and tells you what to do. And so you don't make as many mistakes. And, 
and so that's what happened. And we just, we just progressed and then showed up in 2000, in June of 2002 at Western States 100 and ran the 100 and we both finished and um, we've both been running ultra marathons ever since. Okay. That's that. Uh, no, it's it's nice to hear the the progression and the, the way you actually won the lottery, which actually pushed you to run the hundred hundred mile or, or the hundred k run. Uh, you know, a lot of people, uh, you know, in uh, especially when they're doing ultra marathon, when it comes to hydration and the intake of uh, you know of uh, food, uh, a lot of mistakes uh, they do at the very beginning. You know, now being a coach, you know, uh, where you're advising other people also, my question is that what were the initial you know mistakes which you you know, uh, uh, which took toll on you actually when you were running, you know, which you did actually. Oh, what mistakes did I make? Yeah. When yeah. It comes so to food I mean, and nutrition. <laughs> yeah. I think, well, you know, early on, I ate too much when I was okay. first getting into the sport. I just, I was trying to eat a ton of calories per hour. And really, what I found out the longer I was in the sport and the more I kind of learned and made mistakes and then learned from those mistakes, um, I started and reading on endurance and nutrition. Um, you know, I now coach people to like do the minimal amount of calories they can and think about it from, um, what I call an IV drip of calories. You know, like if you go to the, go to the hospital and you have to get an IV and where they just drip, you know, an IV into yeah. your veins, um, you want to think about that same concept with nut endurance nutrition. And that is like liquid calories. Um, for at least half your calories per hour should come from liquid. Um, and then the others can come from some solids like gels, you know, chews, uh, real food, uh, fruit, whatever, but not, but not very much. So you want to think about never putting a lot in the gut at one time uh, or in the stomach at one time. So always just sipping and little bits at a time every, you know, uh, I like, I like to carry a little bit of calories in one bottle, liquid calories, with some electrolytes and then water in my other bottle or flask or whatever, if you're carrying a, a vest um, and just sipping all the time, every two to five minutes, sip on the calories, sip on the water, wash the stuff out of your mouth. Um, so that's where I learned over time is just to eat less uh, okay. that you can't replace what you're burning during the event or during the adventure or long run or racing, but you can, replenish just a little bit of it enough to tell the brain everything's okay and that you can keep moving and save all that really really complex good food for after the race um okay. that's when you go have fun and eat a bunch of food uh okay. so that's my my tips at least and what i've learned over the years is just less less is better um when less racing better. okay so uh, after i've been racing for a few years i think 2005 was your first big win uh, at the Big Horn Mountain, uh, you know, run. So I think you got a time of 21 hours, 54 minutes, 59 yep. seconds. For um, so tell us, you know, how how did it feel winning it? Uh, what did you do differently? Because suddenly you became very competitive from just being a runner, uh, you know. Yeah. So so tell us, you know, what was the strategy and what are the things you did differently for that race? Well, I you know I um, one of the big differences that one of the things that changed. Uh, in 2004, I ran a uh, Wasatch 100 and I got fifth and I was, and I had just gotten sponsored. Um, back then it was Pat a Montreal Patagonia team. And I, I was trying to start to compete. You know, I've always been a competitive person and played sports and, and so, uh, and I've always been like, okay, well, how can I improve? And I would, I started reading, I started reading on endurance training back then. There was no, there was no coaching in ultras, ultra marathons. There wasn't, you know, you know, coaches were what people you moved to the town where they lived and there was no online coaching or anything like that back then. So all I was doing was I, I got books to start reading and, uh, reading on, I read, read, you know, Ar Arthur Lydiard from New Zealand was a big influence on me in the early days of endurance training. I read a bunch of books by Ar Arthur Lydiard, um, who's now, you know, passed away, but he was a great coach in, in middle distance running and marathon. And so I read a ton of stuff by him. I read uh, uh, Tim Noakes' Lore of Running, uh, that book, and uh, some stuff by Jack Daniels as well. And and so I just started kind of piecing together how to train 
and uh, train more in, intelligently um, than just going out and running every day at the same pace. So I started doing a little speed work. I started, you know, training uh, more volume by using my bike. Um, uh, I also, in 2004, I had some some injuries um, that I was um, fighting, like uh, uh, patella tendonitis in my knee uh, and some other stuff. And I I started strength training harder. Um, I had been always done some weights and strength training in a gym, but hadn't been very consistent in my 20s. I had done it a lot in high school. Um, my coach was a big strength training coach as well. And then, uh, so I got back into strength training pretty hard, uh, in this off season between 2004 and 2005 before Bighorn in 2005. And that really, that base of strength that I, I, I worked on in the off season really helped me be able to run more volume per week because I didn't break down. So I, I had, and I fixed some muscle imbalances that had come from cycling. My hamstrings were strong, were, were, were kind of overdeveloped and my lower quad was underdeveloped a little bit from the cycling motion, um, which cycling really builds your upper quad, but it doesn't work a lot in your lower quad, which is responsible for good knee tracking and, and not causing tendonitis in your knee. So I, I did a ton of squats and, um, and, uh, leg, like leg presses and, uh, and, and tons of upper body and core work. And I got really strong in that off season. And that really helped me be able to handle the mop more, more mileage, more kilometers under my belt for training for Bighorn in, in June of 2005. And so when I showed up, I just, I just ran a race and I found myself in the front um, or up front with the lead pack. And I just, mainly my friend Ty Draney and I were up front. He was another Montreal Patagonia athlete at the time. And uh, we ended up running together and uh, he took the lead, you know, I think at like 80 K and I caught him at about 110 K and was able to like finish stronger than him that in that year and got my first win um, in ultra marathon. And then after that, I was, I, after getting a win, you, you're so focused after that. You're like, Oh, I want to win again. That was fun. Okay. And okay. so I was really focused after that on like training, like how do I train more intelligently? How do I handle more volume? So I kept strength training. Um, I kept that very consistent after that. I was very big into strength training. Um, um, after that. And, and that, I feel like that really helped as well. So that's a piece that I, you know, that I really advocate as a coach is consistent, some kind of consistent strength training in your, in, besides running. Okay. That's, uh, I know, I'm sure you, I mean, uh, at that point of time when you won, uh, you know, how, did you consider maybe, you know, uh, looking at, uh, at a coach uh, or having a coach, uh, you know, uh, for yourself? Uh, was there any consideration at that time? Or, or you, you know, never had a coach. I, I, you know, there was that wasn't a thing. Like when I got into the sport and started, you know, winning in 2005, and, and there was no coach. There was no ultra marathon coaches. I that okay. wasn't even a. You know, that was there. I didn't know any coaches. I didn't. So all I all I was doing was it was all you know, reading, studying, researching online. I mean, I was at the time I was a graphic designer, so I was working on a computer every day. Um, and so I would spend a ton of time researching about that time. I really got into learning about, uh, cadence. So turnover. Um, and I, I worked on upping my cadence and shortening my stride and re and we're working on running form and technique, um, on top of tr strength training. I, I started working on that stuff as well, which really helped. Uh, and that was just all my own self, taught research. Like I just spent a ton of time on the side outside of work researching. And I, I ran my own business at the time. So I had a graphic design business and I was working out of my own, my house. Um, and I just, you know, I, I would, when I wasn't working, I would be researching online, um, what I could do better, how I could improve all those kind of things. So I always, I always, I'm always been kind of a, a, a pretty, you know, my, my wife, I should give her credit. She's the one that taught me to be a good reader. Um, I okay. never was really into reading books that much. I read a little bit when I was growing up and, and, you know, in college, what I had to, to get, to make, 
to, to, to pass, <laughs> pass classes. But she's a she she's a big reader. I mean, she's always reading. Like she always has multiple books going. And so she taught me to. She kind of made me love reading. And and so I, you know, in my twenties, I really started getting into reading. And I would just start that. You know, teach, how do we le learn as humans? We read. And so, yeah. and I just would read. And so I got started getting training books and anything I could find. I mean. I would go to used bookstores and I would go straight to like the sports section and I'd be like, Oh, you know, I'd find these random hardback books by like Arthur Lydiard or Jack Daniels or so anything, I, anything I could find, even if it wasn't even on running, it might be on cycling training, you know, it's still endurance. And so, you know, and then I started, you know, then the internet got really, really good, you know, with Google. And so there were you, all of a sudden there was like the online resources, you know, to like, go after. And so I, I really just started reading and studying and putting together this knowledge base as I became a runner, plus the experience of ultra running, you know, doing it for years and years and years consistently. Eventually you cut, have your own, you know, experience and okay. um, from trial and error and trying things that work and sometimes don't work. And um, so that's just kind of how I, that's how I got into to just doing what I'm doing. And then, and then I, at some point realized that I, you know, I kind of had the epiphany that I should be a coach and um, start coaching people and share that knowledge that I had uh, from all the years of training. So. Okay. That's, that's, uh, you know, uh, I mean, uh, the, all the learning, I think many, many world cars runners also uh, are uh, self coached in many ways. I mean, they understand what they're doing. They understand that bodies over a period of time, I think initially they would have had coaching, but over a period of time, they also realize what they have to do. And they actually make small improvements, which, which makes them, you know, uh, get better in what they're doing. Yeah. Uh, so for you, yeah. So for, for you, I mean, your favorite distance is hundred miles. I mean, for the past, uh, few, few years and you have won quite a bit around uh, 20 plus, uh, you know, hundred milers. Yeah. Uh, 2200 so, mile wins now. Yes. 2200 mile, hundred miles win. Fantastic. So. Uh, tell us what makes this distance so so you know so good for you. Uh, you know, anything which called out to you actually, you know, or that you had to do all 100 miles. Well, I think I think the thing that attracts me to 100 miles is that um, a couple of reasons. One would be that I I like that you can't cheat it because you can't you know like a 5K you can kind of be like oh it's two or three weeks from the race. I've got to get on, start running and get ready for a 5k. Whereas with a hundred miler, you have to start training six months, eight months before. And it, it takes commitment. It takes consistency. So you can't, you can't take a shortcut. There's no, you know, there's no simple way to do it. You have to do the work. And I think that's, what's, what really attracts me to hundred mile distance it, is that you have to do the work and, and it also, pays to know yourself really well pacing uh nutrition hydration electrolyte balance like all the little pieces have to come together like a puzzle and to make a good race and it, it's really hard to do it if one of those puzzle pieces is missing then you're not going to have a great race so okay. the training has to come together with the nutrition with the hydration with the electrolytes and, and everything's a little unique for every person. So every runner is going to be just a little different in how much they need per hour or how many electrolytes they need or how much sodium per liter or they drink or, you know, all those little pieces that you have to figure out. And I like that it's so, I guess the better, best word is it's a technical, it's a technical endeavor. It's really hard. To, it, it's hard to like, there's a lot, a lot of moving pieces that you have to figure out. And I like that about it. It's complex. And uh, plus it's hard. It's mentally hard. And, and you have to be mentally good too. You have to be strong mentally. You have to learn what motivates you, what does motivate you, um, how to stay positive um, or, you know, what we call an, a growth mindset. We have to be able to like, okay, I'm having a bad, bad time. How do I spin this towards a positive, you know, mental aspect of it when you're, when you're having a rough patch during the race? Um, so that's what I like about it. It's hard. It's not easy. 
Um, I think that's what attracts me to it. Plus the adventure of being in the, you know, in wild, wild mountains for, you know, 20 plus hours or 15 plus hours um, through the night with a headlamp on. I, I just, you know, the adventure of it's really cool too. It's, it's, it's not easy. And I think that's what attracts me to it. Okay. Uh, you know, but uh, I mean, a lot of uh, runners also have this, uh, you know, attraction towards distances, you know, so where they're not uh, satisfied with whatever they run. So they go and you know, after 100, they go to 200 then you know, they increase the distances. But you have never done that, uh, you know, though, the, the, I mean, you do back to back hundreds, uh, but you never gone ahead, uh, you know, uh, like I know that, you know, in future one 200 miler is coming, but you never thought in all these years to increase your distance. Uh, 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 how have you not been, you know, bitten by that bug of increasing the distance? Well, I, you know, like after years and years of running, you can start to handle more and more, you know, the, the more you're, the lo the longer you're consistent with running, the more you can handle more running. Uh, you know, you just build like your body gets used to it and it can adapt to it. And so I, you know, I ran 100 a year for seven years and then 200s two 100 milers per year, very spread out in the season. Uh, so I could recover in between very well, uh, for about another six years. So I didn't run multiple hundreds. Like I started running four 100 milers a year in 2014 on. And so I run three to 500, 100 milers a year. Uh, part of that was because I was having success at that distance. And so I was more attracted to that distance. You know, if you okay. have success in something, you kind of want to do more of it. So I, I think that was an attraction to the hundred mile distance um, and focusing on it. And, and because I was naturally good at it, um, I, I was attracted to it. Now I am attracted to the 200 mile distance because I coach Mike McKnight and yes. he's been very, very good at 200s. I've coached other runners to the 200 mile distance now. And so I'm very interested in that distance. So I signed up for Bigfoot 200 this year in August. So it'll be my first 200. So I am going to make the jump to the 200 this year. Uh, but I am doing Western States and Hard Rock double again. So the double really, I mean, running back to back hundreds like that, I couldn't have done that in my early days of training. Like my body mm -hmm. would not have handled it. But after you know, 14, 15 years, I didn't do that back to back. I didn't start doing any back to back hundreds close to each other until I'd been doing the sport 14 years. So okay. I like to always make sure I mention that to people who are listening, because sometimes people get impatient and they just want to jump into like, oh, well, if Jeff's running 400s a year, I can run 400s a year. I want to make sure that everyone knows perspective, right? That I only did one a year for a long, long time. And then I did two a year for a long, long time before I started doing four a year. And some, and then at least one of the two of those races would be kind of back to back where they're three to four, five, six weeks apart. Um, and then, and that set me up to be able to run the double in 2016. And then again in 2018, and then I'm doing it again this year. So um, I, I think, you know, keep it in perspective that I had a lot of experience, you know, um, before I started really trying to do that. Okay. So a hundred miles, uh, you know, uh, first of all, it's nice that you're telling that for the audience sake, it took you around, you know, so many years before you actually did the double because, uh, yes, I mean, a lot of the younger audience are very impatient and they want, uh, you know, I'm sure being a coach, you will have had experiences where they say, okay, fine. I'm currently at running at this pace. And I want to half the pace and run faster than you know what I'm doing in three months' time. Okay, so uh, but yeah, impatience is also not not a great. But that is why I also like ultra running because you cannot cheat that. You know, you cannot exactly. you, know, you 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 cannot cheat on ultra. I mean, you're running a hundred k, even a fifty k. You cannot cheat on it. You, know, you cannot say to yourself that I'm going to run the marathon pace for you know fifty k unless and until you're Kara Grosha. So it takes otherwise. hard work, dedication, and consistency. Yeah. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, what I wanted to ask you about is that if you want, if you just want to give the audience a little bit of taste of like a, you know, base schedule for a, for a hundred, hundred miles, uh, how would you, how would, how should one tackle that? If my question. Yeah. Okay. That's, I mean, it's very unique to the person and their yeah. history and experience. So, you know, someone who's going to run a hundred miles, uh, who just got into the sport, 
is going to have a lot less running per week than someone who has 10 years of experience in running or has been running for 10 or 20 years consistently. So th those, those training schedules are going to look very, very different, but I'll give you an, I'm, I'm coming into a, a week from Saturday. Uh, I'm, I'm running Western States 100. So I just can't, I'm tapering right now. So I'm, I'm just coming out of the big block of training for that, the peak block of training. So to give you an idea of what I was running during the peak block of training, and that's remember that's a build up to um, very intelligent, like ten percent, fifteen percent at the most of 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 more volume per week, taking strategic low volume weeks, in, you know, every two to four weeks, so less volume as you build. So you have a build looks like this on a graph. And then you have a low week and then you keep building and you have a low week. So that's how I, I, how I, I would tell people to intelligently train for a big event is uh, you, you over, you know, if you spread it out over six months, what's that training schedule look like? It slowly builds, builds, builds with, with strategic um, recovery weeks built in. Um, so that's kind of how I train and that's how I train my athletes. It depends on the person experience. Some people I can give them a three week or four week build and then a recovery week. Some people I can only give them a two week build and a one week recovery, two week build, one week recovery. So it just depends on the person. So know that that's, it's a, it's, it's fluid depending on your experience. Um, and the other thing is learning to listen to your body. So if you need to take a rest, extra rest day, learning to be intuitive and know that you need to take extra rest that day or cross train on a bike or go for a hike, you know, instead of a run or, or, or something like that. Um, but the, the peak training for me is about an hour to two hours of running uh, during the week. So okay. during my work week, I'm usually training that. And then on Fridays and Saturdays, so two back, back to back kind of longer runs. So those would be four to six hour runs or three to six hour runs, depending on the day of one of the two of the workouts a week. So when I'm training for a hundred miler and peaking for a hundred miler, I try to get at least two long runs of over three in that three to six hour range. One of them will be like more like three to four hours. And one would probably be more like four to six hours uh, of training. Now in my earlier days, I couldn't handle that kind of volume. I couldn't okay. handle that much training, but, but now I can. And so I can handle, you know, two back to back days, I can handle, you know, sometimes I'll spread the, the long runs out. I might run like a long run on a Friday and a Monday instead of a Friday, Saturday. Uh, it depends on the week. But, you know, I think I t topped out at about uh, 160K of running in a week and about an hour of cycling and about two hours worth of strength training and mobility work. So that kind of gives you like – how much volume I had in a peak week. So that would be like three to four weeks out from a, from a, a, a goal race, a big race, like a hundred miler. Uh, but you know, it, it's anywhere from 10 K run, 5 K to 10 K run. If it's an easy shakeout run, you know, yeah. or, or it might be as long as a, you know, a, a midweek run where it's a shorter run, but still longer it might be 15 K to 20 K run. And then my long runs are more like 25 K to 45 K, uh, training. So that kind of gives you an, an idea of like length of those training runs. Um, sometimes I've done doubles in a day where you'd run like, you know, a short run in the morning and a short run in the evening. Uh, you know, so you might get, you know, 25 K worth of running that day but you broke it into two 12K runs. Okay, okay. Thank, thanks for sharing that. I'm sure it will be useful for the, for the audience also who are listening on to it. So you're, you're a coach now. So you know, I've, been, uh, I've been coaching, I'm not now, I've been for a few years. So how has been this transition from you know, uh, learning about yourself to teaching others? How, has, how, how did you handle that? Uh, I, I really have enjoyed um, the... Well, you know, I was a graphic designer and um, one of the things you do as a designer is you problem solve. You, 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 know, you know, it's problem solving from like a branding and marketing perspective for whatever the product or service that you're trying to market. And so from a running perspective, 
it's been really fun to take that knowledge that I had for 20 some years of, of, of running my own business and, and doing that as a graphic designer and taking that to coaching people in nutrition and training and all those things. Cause I've always been very, you know, I, I've really been into the nutritional side of things and, and, and eating well and eating real food and all those kinds of things. And how does that help your recovery? And so I like sharing that with people. And that's been a great transition because it's very rewarding to help people. You know, at the end of the day, that's what I'm doing is I'm helping someone do better for them, whether they're, okay. whether they're a back of the pack runner trying to beat the cutoff times, you know, and just improve for them. Or if it's someone like Mike McKnight, who's trying to win a 200, um, you know, it doesn't matter who I'm coaching. It, it, I'm trying to help them become a better runner, become hopefully healthier person. So they have longevity and they can do it longer in their life as they get older. Um, you know, or, you know, just, you know, whether we're working on mindset and, and like mental strength, that's going to help them in everything. It's going to help them be a better parent, a better, a better husband or father, you know, a better mother, you know, it's going to help them be a better person, a better employee, you know, all those things. If you're better mentally and stronger mentally and know how to spin something to the positive when you're in a negative situation, then that's going to be good for you. And that's one of the things I love about ultra marathon is it's a, it's kind of a lesson in life and that we're always trying to like be stronger and better and positive. And, and that's what has always attracted me to this sport from the beginning is there's, you have to put all those together. The puzzle pieces all have to come together and they all, they all line up with li how life works. You know, if you're a negative person and, and, and if, you know, something doesn't go right in your life and the first thing you do is go, Oh man, I can't, I can't do that. I can't, I can't, I can't. Um, or I won't, I won't, I won't. Um, you're, you're going to struggle in life. And so if you can say, Oh, whoa, I didn't expect that. Okay. How do I navigate this situation and, and try to get a positive outcome out of it? That's what we're trying to do. Right. And that's what we're trying to do in ultra marathon all the time. We're always trying to say, okay, I, I've got, I've got a challenge. How do I overcome the challenge? You know, how do I get to the other side of this in a positive manner to have a positive outcome? And I think that's, what's in, really cool about ultra marathons okay i mean so the transition i'm sure it has been good uh, but any i mean uh, over the years when you're coached any crazy requests you have received which like you you're baffled by you know just by hearing it oh i'm trying to think if there's anything really really well probably the craziest one has been mike mcknight one in <laughs> during covid he was just bored yes. <laughs> and he wanted to run 100 miles with no calories yeah and so, I tried to talk him out of it, but he is an adult and he can make his own decisions. And uh, so I told him like, as your coach, I don't recommend this, but if you're going to do it, cause I know he's hard headed. That was what makes him good at two hundreds. Um, that if you're going to do it, I'll help you. And, um, and so we just really, you know, we, we got together like, this is that problem solving thing we were talking about just in the, that last question. It, it, it really is. How do we take this challenging situation and try to figure out how to do it? And so that's what we did. We just, we sat down, we got together. We even talked about like, okay, if you're going to do this, like there are even calories in capsules, you know, like the little veggie yeah. caps yeah. that yes, you yes. use electrolyte pills, you know? So we were like, okay, he has to have water and he has to have electrolytes. Like he has to be able to mineralize the water he's drinking and he can't go hundred miles without water and electrolytes. So, but we can't have calories. So that's where he like ended up. We ended up kind of saying, well, he put, he bought bulk like kilo of like potassium, magnesium and sodium. And then he put them in Ziploc bags and then he would just lick his finger and stick it yeah. in the bag and then lick his finger and then he'd sip water. So we even got cut out veggie caps. Couldn't put it in a cap. Couldn't get anything in a capsule because that has a little bit of calories in it. Um, so, I mean, you know, that was probably the craziest request I've ever had as a coach. One of those where you're like, oh, man, I don't think this is a very good idea. Um, um, but, 
but I mean, you know, it, it ended up being fine and he ended up doing it. And, you know, he's yeah. the first person that I know of in the world to ever do that. So, you know, that's what's cool about ultra marathons too. We're pushing boundaries, right? You know, people go, I want to do, I want to try to do that. And you're like, what? Why do you want to do that? Okay, I'll help you. Um, so, okay. you know, uh, yeah. that's probably the craziest one, I guess. I, I I heard that uh, you know this uh, zero calorie thing has also gone to uh, the Tim Nooks. You know, so uh, have you received any feedback from him about uh, this? I haven't. I would love to. If, if Tim Nooks is watching, contact me. Um, I would love to, you know go to my website gobroncoblade.com and go send me an email. Um, I would love to talk to Tim Nooks. I followed him for a long time. I follow him on Twitter. Um, I really, really respect him. You know, if you look back on my, on my, um, one of the books, you can see the big fat book right there. Laura yes. Um, and I really respect him because I'm a high fat, low carb athlete. Um, and he kind of shifted to that later in his life after he got type two diabetes. Um, and I really, really respect him and, and, and I really respect that he's speaking out against, uh, some of the dogma out there that's been entrenched in nutritional stuff. So um, I re really, really respect Tim. Okay, fine. Uh, let me try getting him on the show. And, you know, maybe I will also invite you as, as a, you know, as part of the show and maybe we three can have a conversation on it. Yeah, I would love to talk to him. He's he, he, I, I, a big, 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 huge respect for him. Yeah, I will just step out of it and you guys can talk in the show. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, let's come to the diet part of it because we talk about Team Nooks. So, uh, keto diet is, uh, you know, you are a big, big fan of it and you are, you know, you talk about it a lot more. Uh, just tell uh, the audience, you know, how, uh, I know it's a long subject, but in the, in the short, how has it helped in your, uh, in your development as an athlete and also maybe, you know, improving your longevity yeah. as a well, ultra I think, runner? I think the biggest improvement I've seen as a, a, a older athlete, you know, I'm 49 years old. I turned 50 in August. Um, I, I think the biggest thing I've seen is the recovery uh, is way faster on this way of eating. So, um, and I have to say, I am not a ketogenic athlete strictly. Like I use a ketogenic diet strategically here and there more. Think of it as like a tool, not, it's not a tool you'd use every single day. Like, you know, a screwdriver or a hammer versus, you know, a, uh, a, a different kind of tool, uh, like a tool you'd only use occasionally. That That's w more what it is for me. So I use it and I eat real food. So I eat meat, vegetables, and fruit and starches like potatoes and sweet potatoes. So I eat real food. I don't eat a lot of grains. I basically avoid grains and sugar in my everyday diet 90% of the time. Now that leaves some time to go out to eat with friends or go to a friend's house for dinner that might not eat the way I eat. And, and I don't, I don't worry about it on those times. You know, I'll have rice and I like rice. I'll have rice. Sometimes I'll have beans sometimes. Um, but I, and I'll have sourdough, good sourdough bread or something like that every once in a while or corn chips, you know, or potato chips or something like that. But I don't, it's not like something I would snack on every day. You know, I'll have it occasionally for special occasions, but I won't have it all the time. And so I really just eat, try to eat a whole foods, real diet and avoid grains and sugar in my everyday diet. Now, carbohydrates still have a place and strategic use of carbohydrates have a place. And that's kind of how I approach it. Um, what we call what we've, you know, Vespa coined OFM, optimized fat metabolism. Um, I really kind of follow that approach, which is my carbs ebb and flow with my effort and volume. So I eat more fruit, eat more potatoes during bigger training. And then maybe on a rest day, I might eat less carbs or less carbohydrate and more protein and fat. So it just depends on the day and the training that I'm in. So it's very, very strategic. And, and I find that when I do that, I'm, I recover fast. Um, I'm able to maintain race weight so I don't gain weight um, as much. So I don't, I, I'm not fighting like, oh my gosh, I got a race coming up and I need to, you know, I need to lose two kilos, you know, or something. Then I, it's, it, it's really, I don't have to worry about it. I'm always within, I'm always within a kilo of race weight, um, of, of like, 
like what I'm going to race at. So it just takes a little tightening up and at, at, at right before the race and I'm right at race weight, you drop a, a kilo and you know, I'm right in that right now. So like I'm using it strategically right now. I'm, I'm eating kind of what I call carnivore keto, which is higher protein and ketogenic vegetables, a little bit of fruit around my workouts, like a serving of fruit around my workouts, like an apple or a banana or something like that. But I'm not having a ton of carbohydrate. Um, I'm just having a little bit every day. And then, uh, and that'll help me lose a kilo or so right before Western States. So by the time, and then I'll bring back carbohydrate the last four days before the race. So I'll bring back fruit, some starch like potatoes, right, be right before the race, last four days, top off glycogen, but I've lost a little weight, um, and uh, which helps your VO2 max go up. Um, it helps you run up mountains faster because you're lighter, just like in cycling, you know, the lighter little guys are the good climbers in like the Tour de France or whatever. So um, I, it helps me with that kind of stuff. So weight management as well. And especially as you get older, it really helps with just weight management in general as an older athlete. So I use it very strategically. Um, I would not say I'm ketogenic, except occasionally. So um, I'm more of what probably the better way to describe it is like paleo, uh, paleo eating. So it's I'm using that food list. The paleo okay. eat food list is, is what I stick to mainly for what food I choose. Um, like I said, simple, simple answers, grain free, sugar free and everyday diet. But on race day, carbohydrates. I have simple carbohydrates. I'm sipping on carb calories. Um, I'm taking gels. Uh, you know, I'm eating fruit at aid stations, um, that kind of stuff. Okay. Uh, there's a, uh, thanks for sharing your thoughts on, on, uh, on this. There is a question actually, uh, where yeah. I mean, uh, in, in India, uh, uh, there is a, uh, I mean, almost 50% of the population maybe do not eat meat. Uh, yep. so, uh, how would you recommend, uh, those athletes, you know, tackle, uh, you know, because they don't eat meat, but, uh, how, wh what are the things you might recommend for them? So for my vegetarian athletes, I just, I, I recommend that you have to try, you're going to have to supplement, um, because your protein needs are very, very high as an endurance runner or as a, when you're in training. So it, one of the things that we see in, in like the science has shown that like, after the age of 35, we are, our protein synthesis naturally slows down and is not as efficient. So we lose on average about a half a kilo of muscle per year after the age of 35. So you slowly lose more muscle mass the, lo the older you get. And so you have to up your protein intake. So one of the things we always talk about is whatever your weight is and we go you know in the united states we use pounds so whatever you weigh in pounds you should eat about that in grams a day of protein so i weigh about 139 pounds so i i i tell my athletes you should shoot for 80 to 100 percent of your body weight Wait. in in protein intake a day in grams so that would be about a for me, 120 to 140 grams of protein a day. That's really hard to do if you're a vegetarian. So you, you have to supplement. You're going to have to have protein shakes. You're going to have to, you know, with fruit, you're going to have to supplement beans and rice. You're going to have, because, and the problem with beans and rice is they you're only absorbing, you know, maybe 48% of the, that protein because there's phytic acid in, in phytates in the, in the rice and the beans, there's some lectins in there and they, they block vitamin mineral absorption in the gut. So you have to know that you have to eat a lot to get, be able to get that protein. So that's probably the biggest challenge I have for vegetarian athletes. I coach is getting enough protein and, and, and you see it in their physique, you get leaner, you, you, you lose muscle over time. And the other thing you need to do is encourage muscle building by strength training. I think weighted strength training for especially vegetarian athletes really need weighted strength training. So they're building muscle because you're cannibalizing muscle and losing muscle mass all the time because it's really hard to get enough protein in your diet. So that's my biggest one for vegetarians is like, you got to get the protein in however, whatever works for you, but it has probably going to have to be in supplements. It's probably gonna have to be in powdered, you know, shakes type of thing. Okay, fine. 
thank you thank you for that i'm sure uh, the, the praveen patil was a guy who was asked the question he would yeah. be very happy to hear yeah. it um i know so uh, you know you also talk about you know uh, strength training and cross training and i think there was a challenge which you had taken up in the, during the uh, pandemic uh, you know the body weight challenge with you and your uh, clients uh, yeah. are you still doing it or are, are you still the leader or have you left it have you left we it? do we do challenges all the time um right now i do a weekly challenge uh where most of my athletes have two or three days of some kind of strength training usually one or two days of weights one day of weights and then two days of body weight so it's like air squats side lunges push-ups pull-ups core work um stuff like that bulgarian split squats uh stuff like that so that's on their schedule at least two or three days a week and i do a challenge every week that's four of seven days so they have to do an extra day or an extra two days so a body weight and so that's body weight stuff so they already probably have a and they can substitute a strength training day with weights but it has to be the, the stipulation in the challenge is that it has to be full body it has to be upper body lower body core so okay we always are doing those strength training challenges we did one this year in march you know in the united states uh there's this thing called march madness for basketball for college basketball it's called march madness when they're doing the final four and and all the team college teams are playing down to the final championship and uh we we did our own called march madness and that was like we did a cha- a body weight challenge every day of march so we did 31 days straight i had done it with one of my clients in february as well so i did a body weight strength challenge every day of February, every day of March. So what is that? 31 and 28, you know, a lot of days. Um, and now I'm doing four days a week right now, challenges every week with my athletes. Um, I probably won't do four days next week cause I have Western States. So yeah. I'll take it easy next week. Um, I probably bow out of the challenge next week and not do it. But I mean, for me, it really helps. I like body weights to stuff like air squats, side lunges, uh, a step back lunge with a high knee hold. So you're doing glute, glute engagement work, um, all those kind of things. I think those are really, really important um, glute engagement work and body weight work. Cause not only does it work on strength, it works on mobility and range of motion. So you have full range of motion through the movement and you have good movement patterns, not only forward, but laterally. So, you know, thinking about three planes of motion, and I think that's a really important piece of ultra running and longevity. Okay, uh, Jeff, we have been speaking for, you know, it's this is like an ultra marathon only. We have been speaking for one hour, 12 minutes now. So uh, I, I, I'm i going to come to my last question to you because it's such a wonderful thing here, hearing you speak, you know, a lot of things, a lot of things for everyone to learn. Uh, so my last question is that, what advice would you give uh, for anyone who wants to become the next Jeff Browning. <laughs> uh, consistency, um, hard work, consistency, and dedication pays off. Um, I think doing something for a long, long, long period of time. I mean, I mean, you just have to show up every day. You have to get up week in, week out, and work. I mean, that's the one thing that I've done a very good job of as an athlete. Uh, if I if I was gonna analyze myself as a coach. Um, would be that I'm very, very consistent. And I'm also quick to be intuitive and listen to my body. So if I'm beat up, take an extra rest day, even if it's not on my training plan. Or cross train in something that does not aggravate whatever's going on. So if my knee is sore, for example, well, maybe I need to get on the bike for that day or two days. And until I can go out and run again without pain. Don't run through pain. That will not work. And the, that is a horrible, horrible strategy. So if something is bothering you, figure it out. And that's one thing I've always done is figured it out. So if something's bothering me and, I, you know, I figured it out. I had for multiple seasons, I had runner's knee or patella tendonitis. And I, I didn't accept that it was a limitation. I just said, okay, there's got to be a way to fix it. It's got to be a way to problem solve this. And I went to multiple people. I went to physical therapists. I went to physios. I went to bodywork people. I went to strength training coach and asked him, 
like things. And, and, and eventually I figured out what the problem was. It took a while to figure out what that problem was, but the point is be a problem solver. So figure out what that is. So consistency pays off, hard work pays off, dedication pays off. And, and you do that. And if you do that for years and years and years and years and years and years, the next thing you know, you, you're, you can win some races perhaps. So. Okay. So uh, thank you very much for giving us the uh, you know pleasure to talk to you and uh, you know you're sharing a lot of insights and inputs for all of our athletes uh, and uh, thank you very much for coming in uh, please be in the studio just for a minute I'll just thank the audience any final words for the audience giddy up just, <laughs> just like Billy. There, it was really really great being on the show I really appreciate the time and and, and it was an honor. Thank you so much, uh, Jeff. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yep. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for everyone uh, tuning in. Such a great, uh, wonderful session with Jeff Browning. So many, so many things for everyone to learn. Such great advice, and I'm sure all of you would have benefited by that. Uh, yes, I would also post the YouTube link for the of the of this interview also later. And uh, be tuned in next week. Every week we come out with an interview of one runner. Next week is our very own champion, Suman Rawatji, uh, who was uh, who's an Arjuna Award winner, 3,000 meters steeplechase, a lot of records in her name. Uh, stay tuned for further updates. Thank you very much.